It's not graphically impressive. Those dreadful little, little sprites. You look at the finished result and say, well, that's super simple. Any kid can do that. Quack, quack, quack. Remember you used to look at those old magazine ads of people playing video games and they look like this. And I would shout, what the hell are you doing? They're just stupid, suicidal idiots. No, 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 put the blocker there. Ah! Put that there. We are the there's a reason why we're still talking about it here 30 years later, right? Dundee becoming the Hollywood of the games industry is one that not many people would have scripted. Lemmings was the beginning of a genre, and you can't say that about a lot of games. I remember lemmings incredibly well because at that time when lemmings was released i was working on a game called powermonger and i used to have lemmings on this other computer at my development computer and i had this other computer and then if i got stuck with something then i would play a level of lemmings when lemmings first came out on the amiga my dad bought it day one and i would have been 91, I was eight years old. The first time I actually remember playing Lemmings was over at my friend's house. He had an Amiga A500 and he had a massive black and white TV, so I didn't even know what colour the Lemmings were. I had a green monitor, you know, like a monochrome green monitor at the time. And then you'd have to like rob the TV if you wanted to see it in colour. And that's my first memory of Lemmings is playing it on a black and white TV because his dad was too tight to buy a colour one. So when I first played it, I remember thinking this was something this felt very different, this felt very fresh. It wasn't a traditional puzzle game that we knew. This wasn't chess, it wasn't checkers, it wasn't a crossword, but it had characters and it had environments and it had cool looking art. People just loved the little guys and, you know, had that emotional bond with them, which meant that solving the problem wasn't, you know, an academic process. Solving the problem was saving the guys. For me anyway, you played it for quite a long time and then you put it down and waited for a while and then you came back and then played it again for a very long time. So it was one of those sort of hits where you needed a long time to play it. I bet you none of the other people that you're going to speak to will say this. What really charmed me was at the start, the little trap door would open and you could see a little picture you could see through the trap door there was like you know beautiful clouds and a bit of a countryside scene and that really set the scene for me it made me want to save these lemmings this popular misconception that there's a an aha moment it builds up you know, there's something happens, something else happens, an idea gets clicked, another idea gets clicked, and then it comes together. Why did Dundee become the highest density of computer games developers per head of population of, of anywhere in the world? It's never going to be one single thing, but I think the initial catalyst was this wide availability of really cheap computers. Let's be honest about it, the Spectrum was about being cheap, not necessarily lasting for 20 years. So there's a lot of them didn't pass quality standards and rather than throw them in the bucket. You know, if you knew the right person, you know, five pounds, 10 pounds to get a slightly broken Spectrum that was working fine. There were Spectrums everywhere. It was difficult to find somebody working on Commodore 64 or any of the Commodore computers just because there were so many Spectrums around. There was nobody in Dundee that I knew that didn't have a Spectrum. In, in fact, um, I think most of us had five or six of them. And what do people want to do, young people especially, when they get a hold of a computer, well, they want to play games and they want to write games, and we started to see that around us. Everything that started the computer games in Dundee was all based around the fact that the Spectrums were so easy to get hold of. The Kingswood Computer Club, there was a guy at school called Colin Deasley. He basically said there's this club you, you should probably go to, you'll, you'll quite like it. It was once we got to the computer club 
at the Kingsway Tech that we all started to talk amongst each other and meet other people and find out things that we didn't know before. I'm a little bit of an introvert, so just going out on my own to something like this was a big step, particularly, you know, cross tie and taking everything and just leap of faith kind of thing. But, I mean, it was obviously life changing. I think it's quite interesting that most of the companies in Dundee can stem from that club. There wasn't just the people from DMA Design, but also Chris van der Keil and other members of Viz. They all came to the club as well, and so we all knew each other. I first heard about the Kingsway Computer Club from one of our teachers at school, computing teacher, and he said, look, you guys, myself and Paddy Burns, the co-founder of Chroma and 4G with me, and a couple of other friends, said, look, you guys are really loving computing and you're pretty advanced. You should come along to the Kingsway Club because you'll meet people there who are even more advanced than you, and a bit older than you, and doing amazing things. It was held at a local college. It was a fairly long trip for me. It was like two bus journeys across town. We had to bring our own computers and televisions. So I have my Comet Plus 4 in a big holdall with a portable TV in this holdall that I carried across town. If you've ever walked a couple of miles in the freezing cold, you know, carrying a 14-inch telly, <laughs> along with your carriage way to get to this place, you have no sense of personal danger whatsoever. It was up about three flights of stairs, so there was about 30 of us, and you'd see us all climbing these stairs, lugging large portable televisions around. I think it was a old chemistry lab, because it had the big desks with the kind of ports for the boots and burners and all that kind of stuff, and we just set up. Plugging Spectrums and Commodore 64s and... Dragon 32s, it was the Origatmos, which everybody was like... So sometimes you'd get an exotic Atari 800s or 400s. If you had a particular machine, you, you defended it, you no know, matter what it was. Some of the rich people would even have disk drives, and they would kind of split into two or three groups. There was the guy who ran the club who was really wanting to talk computer science and proper stuff. There was those of us who were not interested in that at all, who wanted to play and look at games, and we would go off into a different corner. Unlike most of the other people there, who were just there to kind of swap games and copy them, three or four of us were really interested in what made the computers tick and how you can replicate all these games that we saw other people do. In the club, what you'd find is people would bring in bits of code they'd been working on uh, and showing you know, how they'd developed or they'd gone away for the week with a task and come back and solved it. A few of us got together and we wrote a Jet Set Willy editor and a Manic Miner editor, which allowed you to remake levels. And in the case of Jet Set Willy, actually fix things so that you could finish the thing. For us, it wasn't a natural home. It almost felt like the older generation, and we're really talking about literally two or three years older than us but when you're that young that feels like a long way away from you they'd already settled in it was their club and their thing and, and i suppose it did become the company that they started i was the first one at the computer club as far as i remember russell and dave kind of arrived together one of the chaps that went there actually lived around the corner from me and he said that he'd give me a lift each week so I got to know him. Turned out his name was Dave Jones. Oh, well, Dave was ultra cool because he had a car, had some money and could get spare parts for Spectrums. Yeah, I think that Steve had said that he was there first for a while and then Russell and Dave appeared about a year later and then me a year or so after that again. So Steve had been going for a long time. The ones that went on to make games had the hacker mindset, you know, the hackish mentality, really problem solving. Here's the end result, how do we get there? And, you know, we need to solve the problem of how you do this, how you get the game fast enough, how you get the graphics looking good, you know, how you get the graphics moving. So we spent an awful long time just showing each other little demos of stuff we've done over the weekend. Russell, it would usually be a new sprite routine or scroll routine because on a spectrum it was tricky and, and he came up with a nice fast way of doing it. Oh, I could suddenly do multiple directional scrolling. Let's do a game based on that, just to try and use it, basically. I'd be similar, I'd, I'd maybe have a new multiplexer routine that I wanted to play with, or a new scrolling system or something like that. I remember a lot of programmer talk between Russell and Mike that went way over my head, <laughs> mainly.
We all got on incredibly well together. We had a blast. It was, we were having fun. That was the thing. We were having fun. At that particular time, I don't think any of us had any idea what it was like to have a hit like Lemmings. Because we didn't really care because we were still having fun doing what we were doing. Dave is a dreamer, which is the kind of person you need in a creative company. And he's got a real eye for, for being able to sort of see things that people can't normally see and describe them as if he's seeing them right in front of him. And it's quite a almost creepy experience to, to behold. And Dave managed to upstage the, the whole lot of us. When you went into this this club, uh, there'd be a, you know, a smattering of people at the back in the middle, setting up their various machines. But this time it was different. You know, this time I went in and there was a crowd of people just right up at the top, you know, crowded around something that was making all these rather impressive noises. Instead of you know the beeps and the you know the chip tune kind of music, this was this was high quality stuff. And so I went up, you know, pushed my way to the front, and here was Dave Jones. He had a Commodore Amiga 1000, and and this was it's it's impossible to describe just how much of a leap this thing was over our old 8-bit machines. The thing I remember most, you had Defender of the Crown on screen. This, you know, gorgeous looking game, better graphics than anything else in the room, and I just moved the mouse up, clicked at the top, pulled the screen down, and there was another program running underneath it, and that was a Deluxe Paint. Mind-blowing. So, of course, at that point, I need to get one of these, which didn't happen for quite, quite a number of years, but... <laughs> I blew my college grant on an Amiga 500. Dave had been considering leaving Timex and wanted to make games, and he managed to get a contract with somebody in Edinburgh, he had made a bunch of Amstrad games for Ocean and wanted somebody to make the Spectrum game. So Dave asked me if I could help him with that, which I did. And we both started out making this game that was eventually released called Zone Trooper. It was very bad, but anyway. So I was like, oh, he's real developers. They're making an actual game, which was really cool. I learned that Dave wasn't very good at finishing the game because he left me to finish it all off and that you really need to get an artist because at that point I ended up doing all of the art and while I'm passable, it's not my strong point. Enough said about that. I remember Cygnosis being a very interesting, kind of compelling company in those early days. Back in the, the formative years of, of the video games industry, a lot of it had this sort of homebrew feel. But then there were a couple of companies that came along that, that did things slightly differently, one of which was Ultimate Play the Game. But another one was Imagine. The games weren't that great. Um, they did a couple of nice little games on Spectrum, but certainly their bluster and their this is a spectacle uh, and, and showmanship, as it were, was, was, I would say, almost unprecedented at the time. They were such a, you know, mouthy, <laughs> Arrogant worst company. Um, but yeah, not surprising that they uh, they went the way they did, I guess. You get your foot off the door, please. Thank you. Obviously, it was born out of the demise of Imagine Software. So the higher order creatives and myself got together and said, you know, this is too good to leave. The market was exploding. You know, we could bring a level of creativity and technical ambition and innovation to what was other a bit of a me too market so whether it was barbarian pteropods you know the, those types of games we were also pushing the envelope in terms of packaging design the logo was very kind of fancy they had all this beautiful kind of roger dean artwork that they put on their game boxes and on their advertisements you know everything looked like a kind of 70s you know prog rock album cover or something and that was really really alluring
Dave Jones, Martin Edmondson, Martin Chudley. These guys wanted to fulfill their kind of intellectual dreams of making the games that they wanted to make. And our attitude was, look guys, just worry about making games. Put all your energy, all your effort into making games. We will support you with development systems, hardware, coffee machines, toilet roll supplies, offices, you know, whatever it takes to put you in that kind of cosseted environment so you can just concentrate on making games. And the stable of developers that produced DMA Design, Traveller's Tales, Reflections, was, I think, second to none. He doesn't come across as, as somebody that passionate about creativity. And yet, once you get going, he's very much about you know, picking up the creative people uh, and, and what they do. And I think you know, a large part of that would have come through in terms of the talent spotting at, at, at Cygnosis would be, um, well, my sense of it is that it was, you know, Ian drove a lot of that. So we went down to a computer show in London and we showed this demo to a lot of companies. And bizarrely, the last company we showed it to was Cygnosis. We were in a meeting with Ian Hetherington and uh, he was quite dynamic about it. He was, uh, I seem to recall, he picked up one of the boxes of one of his existing products, maybe Shadow of the Beast or something, slid that along the table and said, this is, this is last year, what you've got is something new. We weren't left by the wayside. We were given a nice, healthy payoff. And then Ian offered the other two guys permanent jobs. And Ian said to me, I like your music. I like what you did on the Pugsy thing. We've definitely got more work for you. And so the first thing I was asked to do was Shadow of the Beast 2. Yeah, but that, that just totally blew my mind that I was going from literally nothing to composing music for the second iteration of a game that had done like amazing things for them. So yeah, I was kind of in awe of him, I think. When he offered me praise and then offered me a job and then built me a music studio, um, yeah, you know, he was like uh, quite the benefactor uh, to my career, has to be said. Tim Wright was the, um, the uber games enthusiast and he was a very, very competent, multidisciplined musician. You know, this is obviously the early days of synthesizers and the like. Dave had gone down to see Ian Hetherington and taken the demos that he'd made. And one of the great things going for it was the artwork was gorgeous. Spent quite a bit of time doing just some small effects which worked quite nicely and managed to source some sound effects that gave it quite a bit of oomph. I think those aspects secured the contract. We were all quite surprised and we weren't quite expecting it. We knew we had something which looked nice but it was gratifying to get the contract with Cygnosis. When I first met Dave Jones, uh, you know, he struck me as a, a particularly bright guy. Secondly, a passion, you know, for gaming and tech. This is the chemistry of what it took and still takes, quite frankly, to make an original IP, you know, not version 12. So the first game was called Menace. did very well. I mean, Menace was, you know, took the classic sideways scroller, shoot him up, very arcade-centric sort of game. It was very much based on Nemesis, an arcade game. Part of that was where there is a ship and as it fires missiles, the missiles follow the landscape. And this was an effect that we were quite keen on, but we could never quite master. And actually, it was in the process of trying to master that that I came up with the algorithm that we applied to Lemmings for following a landscape. So one does follow on from the other. You were kind of influenced by the reviews. 
So you look at the reviews and the reviews are saying, well, you know, Blood Money is a you know, technical version of Menace. Dave and I would feel we'd underperformed at that point. You know, we just had to try harder. We were all sitting in the back of this classroom in the, the old building at uh, Dundee Institute of Technology, and we we're doing this really boring class on database parallelism. And Dave was sitting in the back of the class. He had a piece of grid paper just sitting down there and a printout of a bunch of graphics, and he was sitting there writing down the block numbers of the graphics to build the levels for Menace. And then he just turned to me one day and said, hey, would you like to do the Atari ST version of Menace? And I'm like, okay. So the following day, I went down to Edinburgh, bought a Atari ST, and that was it. That's how I got started. Mike Daly, he was converting over another Psygnosis game to the Commodore 64. Dave had shown Psygnosis this game that I could do, and he got in this conversion for um, Ballistics. And off the back of that, I got asked to, well, if Mike was doing the, the coding, could I convert all the graphics? And that was how I got into the games industry, turning these lovely Amiga 16-colour high-res graphics into a Commodore 64 three-colour character set. I'd just been kicked out of college, and I spent three months of it at home and then at Russell Kay's house. He and I were in my bedroom. He'd be writing a port of Menace on the PC, and I was doing ballistics. Yeah, Russell's bedroom I uh, had uh, a couple of big items of furniture that I think there was a plank of wood put in between them so that we could get three in a row. But we did that for about three months, um, having lunches in his kitchen and then back up to the bedroom to do programming. But one part of ballistics was the loading screen, which was this lovely high-res graphic on the Amiga. So I went through it, took a photo of the, the screen, got that developed, you know, drew grid lines on it, and then kind of carefully tried to pixel layer, pixel layer, and match it all up. And it was in Russell's bedroom. We were working on this game, and Russell uh, declared that, oh, yeah, he's written a program that could convert that automatically. OK, well, let, let's go with the program. So the first office was really good, actually. Dave's then girlfriend, her in-laws owned a really well-known chippy in Dundee uh, called the Deep Sea. And there was two sides. There was one across the road that was just a kind of takeaway. And then there was one on the other side that was a rest full restaurant. And above it, there was a, this little place that we used for storage. So Dave, being related to them, or about to be, managed to get it from them for an office very cheaply. So he got it decked out and it was just two rooms and a toilet, basically. And it was only me and Dave to start with anyway. So Dave took the, the nice view right in the front that looked out over Perth Road. And that's where all the students walked up and down because there was universities all over the place. So Dave got distracted quite a lot watching all these students go by. I do remember the, the creation of DMA design itself. And that was in, not, not the Kingsway Computer Club, but this was a computer club at uh, the Dundee Institute of Technology. Dave, he has this fantastic ability to just get people gathered around the table. And this evening he was spitballing possible names for his new company. I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that he, he already had decided. But, you know, so, you know, we all threw out things... Uh, uh, Russell suggested Visual Voyage. I suggested Milliard because I read that in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and that was shot down. And Dave liked DMA because in the in computer terms, it means direct memory access. And he said, it because this could stand for direct mind access. And oh, that was cool. So yeah, that became DMA design. And you've probably heard that DMA stands for doesn't mean anything. Well, it stood for direct mind access, and that lasted, I think, until the end of the evening. 
So Gary Timmons was a couple of years above me at St. Saviour's High School in Dundee. And he was a quiet guy, a really, really nice guy we knew to say hello to. And he was certainly, on, like many of us, on the kind of geeky end of, of life. But unusually, Gary was definitely interested in art. You know, he did really well in the art department at school. And he was the guy that you heard about doing computer art when nobody else really was around us. I became a Christian when I was about eight, well, when I was 18. And then when I started going to a Christian church and Christian activities, uh, that was, I think, when I, I first met Russell. I'd known Gary as uh, a family friend. I got chatting with him and he explained what he was doing, the work at DMA Design. And I was invited to come up to the, the new DMA Design office, which had just been opened in the Nethergate in Dundee. So I went up and met with the other team members there. There was Dave Jones and Mike Daly. I was interested in animation. I'd always been keen on cartoons, animation. Gary had always been fascinated with Disney movies and doing animation. And Dave basically put him in front of Deluxe Paint, showed him how it worked. And Gary was completely hooked on doing animation within Deluxe Paint. I did some character walk cycles to learn the, the capabilities of the animation aspects of Deluxe Paint. And after a, a few weeks there, I was invited to become a, a staff member. Without really a formal interview, it was very casual at the time. And it's always fascinating to watch Gary because the way you, he works is that he would just put single pixels down and advance the frames and move those pixels. And those pixels would be guide ones for how all the limbs would move and how the heads would move. And he would get the motions the way that he wanted, first of all, and then he would actually put in the body of the character. It was always fascinating to watch him working. Well, of course, no one has credited D-Paint with gaming on the Amiga because it was this incredible art package that did things that no other art package at that time even attempted to do. You know, without D-Paint, I'm not sure there would have been a populace. It was so powerful. I mean, if you look at it today and compared it to Adobe, it's nothing. But it had brushes and you could do incredible things and... I can remember walking along Tottenham Court Road and seeing the Tutankhamun's head, which I should never go back and see because in my mind, that Tutankhamun head was photorealistic quality. I think if I went back and looked at it now, I'd probably be very disappointed. But it was widely used by the development community at that time, really, really was. It was an incredible asset to us. In the really early days of DMA, around sort of blood money menace time, I didn't really see them very often. I was away at university studying computer science in Edinburgh, and they'd been a couple of years older than me. They were really starting to hit their stride as, as the Amiga hit uh, about sort of 1987, 88. I actually finished my degree in the morning, did my final exam, and then in the afternoon came into the office, sat down and started writing lemmings. They're going to throw a bunch of names of famous video games at me, and it's my job to figure out if that game is a true original or if there is an obvious predecessor or antecedent or point of inspiration for it. Spicy players. Ooh, uh, that was, well, it's kind of a duck shoot. I can't think of anything before Space Invaders. Because it's so early. I think it's a genre-defining original. So I'm going to say... I would say that was a true original. I guess his treatment is a, is a true original. No antecedent, true original. Pac-Man. Um, Pac-Man. Uh, I feel like there is something out there, an even more basic version of that concept. I feel like there was, but I'm claiming an age memory block on that one. <laughs> nope, Pac-Man was an original. I'm, I'm going to say Pac-Man is pretty original for me. Uh, yeah, that was a, that's a true original. I think that really started the maze game genre. 
I'd say true original. A labyrinthine pellet gobbler. Oh, Pac-Man is definitely a true original. I am also going to take a risk and say true original. Resident Evil. Uh, sweet Home on the Famicom, so I'm getting a bit nerdy there. Resident Evil, a lot of people see it as the original survival horror game, but it is, of course, an evolution of games that came before it, such as... Um, 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 from the Infograms, what was that called? I was going to say Into Darkness. I forgot the name of that game. Fear of the Dark or something. <laughs> I've forgotten the title. Uh, Alone in the Dark beats it for the uh, isometric, well, not isometric, you know, the, the camera angles in polygonal characters. Yeah, Alone in the Dark. That's what I'm trying to think of. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. Alone in the Dark. Now that you mention it, very, very similar style of gameplay, right? Moving through your kind of haunted mansion, a series of kind of fixed camera angles. I like Resident Evil, but I've never thought it is incredibly original. Resident Evil, an evolution. Call of Duty. Uh, anything with a gun before Call of Duty. Call of Duty, definitely an evolution. Um, there's numerous first-person shooters before Call of Duty. Well, that's definitely not. I mean, that's um, Medal of Honor. They made one of the uh, Allied Assaults, and because uh, EA made a load of sort of stupid requests, like you had to have a gun at all times in the game and stuff like that, they left. I mean, Call of Duty, you, you've got to go all the way back to... Uh, Wolfenstein 3D. Wolfenstein 3D is like, you know, what felt like the first really viable 3D shooter. It's a game building on lots of its predecessors, so it's definitely not a, a true original. I'd say it's Wolfenstein. Minecraft. Oh, Minecraft. Um, Minecraft, Minecraft, Minecraft. That's a true original. Minecraft is just digital Lego. Mm. Uh, 3D construction kit on the Amiga. <laughs> That's straight to that I think that would be a true original. I think that the idea of sort of level building was a really unique concept for Minecraft. It's a true original. It's unique. There's nothing like Minecraft. Minecraft, uh, no, that's a, a knockoff of Infinity Miner to an extent. Again, that's uh, ins inspirational for future things because of how popular it got. But it wasn't the original. Oh, lemmings. <laughs> no. No, certainly nothing before Lemmings. I could think of a lot of things that had elements similar to Lemmings with, with platforming and, and puzzling. But I can't think of anything that, that felt quite the same to play as Lemmings. Lemmings true original. Yeah, definitely. I would say that Lemmings is a true original. Yeah, true original. I'm going to call it a true original. Lemmings, yeah, definitely. That was, I would say definitely Lemmings is a true original. What I remember when I first sat down with it in 1991, when that Amiga disc came into the office, was I've not seen anything like this before. Yes, Lemmings is original. Having lived through making it, I can see where all these things actually came from. But there wasn't something that, that we built distinctly upon. We pulled strands from lots of different places to create the game. It's just its own thing. It's, it's a sort of encapsulation of a, a bullet point in time before Lemmings and after Lemmings. BL and AL. <laughs> But it was the animation that really nailed it. They did feel so alive. You know, the fluidity of their animation was just, it just stood out from anything else, especially from Populous, where the animation and the little characters were literally, you know, two frames. We just switched between legs that facing that way and legs facing that way. And that was a walk animation. And then along came Lemmings with their green hair and their, you know, the whole body animation, it would, it just stood out from the crowd. This might be controversial, but Dave wasn't the creator of Lemmings. That was, that was Mike. That was Mike and Gary. They really gave those little eight pixels some really good character. Dave had been hiring a guy called Scott Johnson to come in to do art for his next game, Walker. So he brought Scott in to do basically graphics. Scott had been working in a McDonald's, I believe. He was doing it at home. He'd come in and show us the stuff he'd been working on. And he, he drew a little guy for the walker to shoot. But the guy was quite big. Um, he was about 16 pixels high. And the walker must have been about 48 pixels high. So he, the guy was really large beside him. 
And Scott and I had this argument about, oh, he's too big, no, he's not too big, all this kind of stuff. Back in the early days of the Mega and ST, we spent many lunch times playing Oids. We were fascinated with the um, tiny characters that you're rescuing. Fond memories of playing Choplifter as well, and that had similar sort of characters that always had a lot of animation, a lot of character to them. They would wave at you and they would run around, fascinated that they could get so much into so little. So I think it was something that Mike was want to investigate and see how small you could get a character but still keep the the essence of a character that you would be able to see the, what they were doing on screen. And in one lunchtime, he did an animation of some little characters walking along, getting into difficult situations falling off cliffs. And then that's what I showed to the guys for Walker. It was nothing that I mean. it, was, it was to say, hey, this is what Walker could be. It was quite a compelling graphic that he ended up making. They were showing lots of character in a very few amount of pixels, and he created lots of them moving around the screen, and they were all being killed in different ways. It was only a few frames long, but because of the, the repeat facility in D-Pain, and also something called Anim Brush, where you could select an area of the screen and then paste that animation somewhere else. You could move the, the Anim Brush so it would paint the figure around the screen as you moved the mouse, but cycling through the, the frames. And it was quite a, a fun animation. It, it raised a few smiles and a few laughs. And then Gary Timmons sat down, because I was using his Amiga to, to do these animations, and he sat down and he he, he fine-crafted the animation a little bit because mine was a bit stiff and crude. So I took a look at it and I thought there was maybe ways to enhance the, the animation of the character to make it look more loose. So I did a little tweaks here and there. I changed the, the animation of the hair so it was more bouncy. I did changes to the foot animation as well. So other than being rigid feet, they were more floppy and animated. And I changed the, the animation of the arm as well. It was a side view. So I can show one arm going backwards and forwards. That animation had a, a little more a little more dynamic, a little more character in it. This is more an analysis of the little pixels that made up the animation. Wow, 10 by 7 pixels. <laughs> yeah, arms. Uh, it's amazing how this is kind of being conjured. You know, how on earth with such a limited number of pixels? Uh, 7 by 10 said here, I, I, I was always in my head, I thought it was 8 by 8, but I'm sure that was just me uh, thinking of standard computing dimensions. So there you go, just 7 frames of animation, and that's the character you can get from that. Is, it's crazy how <laughs> there it is. Yeah, as soon, as soon as that moves, that's got character. You can immediately project character onto that. I don't remember Mike being an animator at all. That's good for Mike. He's, he's such a hardcore coder. I see him. So you've even got yeah, even sort of like that bouncing hair now. That is really impressive for just a square on a screen that you could just about see. I mean, look at that artist adaptation is brilliant. At least people still need artists with such little pixels. <laughs> I think the hair flapping about looks great, actually. See, it's the movement of the arm that adds so much character to it. I mean, you're literally talking about, you know, one pixel here or one pixel there. I mean, it's incredible. It's 10 by 7 pixels. Really incredible. What Gary's done here, suddenly there's weight and feel um, it's more convincing and you know in all, in all sorts of ways those changes are enough to kind of just you know, imbue that character with a little bit more life those were the days the glory days can't beat it 
So the traps and things started to come in in the very first animation that Mike did. He showed all of the, the kind of lemmings, the characters. They didn't have a name back then, but the characters were all basically lining up to die. And that's basically where the name lemmings came from because we took a look at it and went, oh, they're like lemmings because of the apocryphal story that they all jump off cliffs. I added a, a few more hazardous situations for the, the characters to be in. There was a, a set of clapping hands that would that would squash the, the characters, and there was a, a mouth that would bite the characters. Oh, I've seen this. Yeah, this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> the the mouth eating them is absolutely terrifying. Look at that, and the little gun shooting them. That's amazing. It does make me think that Lemmings could have been a lot scarier if we'd had more clown faces with ginormous teeth. I think it really questions the mentality of the artist here, what they're doing. Do you want to be <laughs> sadistic as possible to tiny little characters that you've, you know, you've sort of got a personality for? Get this in a museum, it's great. I'm just looking at the 10 tons coming down on uh, on a lemming. Even though it's only 7 by 10, you, you, you kind of feel, oh, that poor thing. That is a testament to great artwork and great animation. It was amusing to watch, but I think maybe Russell caught on that there was maybe a, an idea for a game in the essence of that. And we sat around after he'd completed it and came out, there's a game in there somewhere. Don't know what the game is, but there's definitely a game in there. If he hadn't noticed that, uh, there would have been no lemmings. Um, so I think it's, it's fair to say that his contribution is um, enormous. <laughs> Basically, every game we've ever started was based on, oh, I've got a cool little routine that I want to try out for something, and we'd do a game based on that. It was all down to some kind of tech that we, we had that we wanted to use. One of the things that we'd been playing with on Menace and Blood Money was this idea of characters, bombs, moving across the surface of a landscape. And I took the graphics that Mike had created and made a demo using that algorithm that I'd come up with and showed all these characters moving across the screen. And it's kind of part of it was to get as many as possible. And we had a goal of 100. On the PC at that time, I managed to get 80 on the screen and still keep it within 30 frames a second, which was quite important. I think people forget how difficult it was back then to actually get lots of things moving around and being replaced and then on the next frame advancing one pixel across. People take that for granted now. We have so many megapixels being moved around screens. We reduced the amount of colours of the animation. Three colours in the sprite for the character and it was because it used so few colours that the programmers were able to then create so many on screen. And the reason that Lemmings are the colours that they actually are is because on a PC, those were the colors that I could use and still keep the frame rate up. So the green, white, blue, and a clear background were used because of the way that the EGA hardware worked. It's hard to imagine lemmings now without green hair uh, because the green hair is, is just what makes them. The green hair and the blue kind of overalls, uh, overalls, I'm thinking of Mario, the, the blue kind of cloak thing. So many games back in those days were about, you know, these eureka moments, you know, let's mix the train following with the lemmings and in Populous's case, let's mix the little characters with different more landscape. And they were, you know, real eureka moments that changed the whole game, I guess. The initial demo, which again, we've got it available on Mike's website, then that demo was just a proof of concept. It really doesn't allow you to play too much it really only has walkers in it. That version, uh, we showed Psygnosis. To our surprise, they passed. <laughs> they said, no, we're not actually interested in this. I think it wasn't a very psygnosis -y type game at that point. They'd been known for the big graphics levels and big games, high concept games, that, that sort of thing. <laughs> the Amiga was the 
dominant piece of hardware in the marketplace at the time, technically. And commercially, I think. Amazing Amiga. And it's certainly a radical machine. Awesome. Which is why, in fact, we were in pursuit of the Amiga. Part of what was selling systems back then were games that really illustrated what a huge graphical leap 16-bit represented over the 8-bit, you know, Commodore 64 and Spectrum and Amstrad consoles that we had had for years. And companies like Cinemaware and Cygnosis were at the forefront of that, whether it was Defender of the Crown or Shadow of the Beast. These were games that were really built to showcase the graphical improvements, the huge leap. When you went into practically every computer shop at the time. Shadow of the Beast was a game that was running on TVs because that was the most impressive looking Amiga game at the time. So that was the one that they would always play to show off how great an Amiga looks. That was quite a significant cultural impact at the time. I remember seeing the first screenshots from things like Shadow of the Beast and Defender of the Crown thinking, wow, this is like a whole new generation of games. It looked phenomenal, it was in all the shops, but... When you actually played it, it was in a classic. Nobody talks about Shadow of the Beast these days as being a fantastic game. Maybe a fantastic looking game, but certainly not one of the best games ever made. Shadow of the Beast, which wasn't one of my favourite games at all, is a game that's pure tech and little substance. After a while, Cygnosis, for those first few years, began to cultivate a bit of a reputation for very flashy graphics, beautiful presentation, but not a lot of substance. Yeah, Cygnosis. Looks like a fish, moves like a fish, steers like a cow. That's a quote from Hitchhikers. But people would complain about the gameplay. Lemmings, no, admittedly, at that point in time, didn't really you know, scream that it was a Cygnosis game. But we took it around to quite a few publishers, and they all passed. <laughs> but we were sure that we had something at this point. And it wasn't until we had a few levels in place, and it wasn't until he went and pitched it again to Ian Hetherington that uh, I think Ian really saw the potential in it. Going back to how we were introduced to Lemmings, I remember it so vividly. The very first thing I saw of Lemmings was a, a circular animation, a deluxe paint animation of these things basically marching around what was a level of lemmings. Obviously it was completely non-interactive, but you just you know, you just sat and stared at it and you thought there is something magical about this. Some of the great great stories of things that we love often have this first refusal from people at the time. I'm not terribly surprised to learn that a game like Lemmings was initially rejected by publishers because it takes a certain amount of vision to understand that a game being very different need not be a negative. Back in the day that DMA were trying to take this out, you could imagine publishers saying, no, I want another game that looks exactly like the one that was at number one last week, which is about the level of imagination most of them have got. Do shooters, do fighting games, do platform games. You know, we were still very much in the stone age of video game development back then and the ways that we thought about video game design. Nothing like what we have today where all things are possible. We all agreed that it had a lot more potential than people were actually seeing in it. I think that it's when you're young and stupid, then it's easy to do that. <laughs> they started on Walker, that got shelved. They started on another game called Gore, they got into that and then that got shelved and it was only after that where Dave picked up Lemmings. Lemmings was a lot of fun to work on. During the, the production I was the main character animation for the skills, most of the things that, that the Lemmings did in the game. We knew that we wanted the Lemmings to have to get from A to B and we knew that we wanted to make them do things. The breakthrough came, Dave Jones took the original prototype and he added mouse movement in. It wouldn't be the direct control of a character as you would maybe control the main character in a game through a joystick, moving left and right and maybe press a button to do a, a jump action or some other action that the character would perform. The actions for Lemmings were selected from a panel, then when the action was selected, that could be assigned to an individual lemming. 
And that was when we realized that we had something really quite compelling, was being able to, using the mouse, precisely target a lemming and then be able to tell him to do something else. That was quite a breakthrough in terms of the gameplay side of things. And everything basically followed from there in terms of we knew we needed some way of taking away the landscape and we developed a technique of rendering the graphics background so that we could remove masks from there so that we could create the holes. And to take away the ground, there was a a basher introduced that would bash horizontally through a solid piece of ground. A digger would dig vertically down. Then we did climbers because we had to climb out of holes that we dug. Then it was bridge builders, get over those holes. So that was where a, a builder came from. So we started to build up more of the the character interaction with the background. If they came across a wall, the, they would turn around, walk the other way. We had fallers quite quickly, actually, as well. So, yeah, we had fallers, and to stop fallers, we had floaters. And the nature of having all these lemmings and them moving around, we knew we needed a blocker to be able to stop them and so that you could create a pool and then follow the rest of the puzzle. Dave had been playing around with explosion graphics at one point, and that was where going nuclear and exploders kind of came from. So I think it's one of those serendipitous things that sort of one thing led to another, and it was all fairly logical, at least in our heads. I would create the the animations for these, the little character digging, which was a lot of fun to, to animate because he would throw up handfuls of ground as the, the ground got taken away and the lemon would get, get lower and lower. The basher, as he goes through his actions, his hands actually become temporarily bigger as he makes his big fists to bash his way through. The miner, but I would have his body weight come off the ground as the, the pick would come down. So it would make it more interesting to watch in order for a a lemon to be able to safely fall a dangerous height. I think I came up with the idea for the lemon to produce a little umbrella, but that was one of the the skills where, other than the lemon just being the three basic colours, additional colours were required to have the, I think it was a little yellow umbrella with dots on, Uh, So that was where the sprite had to be a different type using more planes of graphics colours. But because there weren't so many being used at once, that was a skill that could accommodate the additional colours in the graphic. It did iterate and evolve very, very quickly. This didn't take months and months. This took weeks to go from that sort of deep eight animation to the first two or three playable levels. When I see that particle explosion, what I see is is your ship uh, in Defender exploding into like a big shower of particles. Okay, what happens when a lemming dies? Let's make even that look kind of cute and fun and silly. It's so often how they execute the smallest details that makes a game like that memorable. The next thing is the geometry of the levels. They're changing the bitmap on screen, you know, when an explosion explodes, you know, just the bitmap changes and the way that the the little lemmings navigated around this new terrain. I can remember Glenn and I, I think, were trying to work out how they did that. I still would wonder if I looked at it now because of the smoothness of those those characters. I mean, we were huge Populous fans and Populous is all indirect control as well. So I don't think it was that big a leap to go we're controlling lots of things. How should we do that? Oh, Purpose already does that. Let, let's do it that way as well. But having that little panel and the different skills that Dave and Gary come up with, that was obviously the key to the whole game. The core mechanics was breaking the landscape apart and destroying the landscape and digging the holes and punching uh, punching tunnels through the landscape and still expecting these characters to be able to conform to that landscape as you were 
uh, changing it constantly. Um, to be able to pull all that off uh, that early on is not a kind of proof of concept to to prove that it was doable. Um, if none of that had happened, you got to imagine that there would have been no Lemmings and uh, there would be no uh, fantastic 30 years documentary <laughs> three decades down the line. All the eight skills that Lemmings had. Right. Oh, that's unfair. Uh, lemmings skills, Lemmings skills. This is probably where I look like an idiot and forget something. Uh, I don't think I'll remember all of them. The... Uh, um, uh, uh, um, there's a blocker. Blocker. The blocker, of course. That's the most iconic, isn't it? Checking, checking, like you know, like they're just making sure you're not getting into the wrong nightclub. Um, <laughs> different skills. Oh god. Um, oh. There was. I, I would know what it was called, but there was a parachutist, I guess. <laughs> This is not going to be my my mastermind subject, is it? Oh, like the, the didn't they have a little umbrella like going downy ones? The umbrella one, obviously, was my favourite. Uh, floater, which is the one that you use to prevent lemmings from dying when they smash into the ground, which was really playful and fun. Okay. Uh... Uh... A digger. There was a digger. You could go duck straight down. Of course, which the big hand motions smashing down. Yeah, straight down, so that was three. Wait, were there multiple types of there multiple types of digging ones, right? Oh, there was bash. So you hit the basher. Uh, yeah, the punches one, ones that kept punching their way through. Through the walls, sideways. So there was dig, there was bash. And uh, I can't remember any others. <laughs> There was a diagonal dig, if I remember correctly. So what was the one that did diagonal? Ah, oh, there's a minor. Yes, there was a minor with the big pickaxe. You could go diagonally. That's five. So you said there were seven. Is that right? Eight. Ooh. Ooh, I'm doing quite well. Five. Oh, climber. Six. The lemon will just crawl on the wall. That was a really weird climb, was it? Uh, we also we also had ones that could could build something. I swear there were ones that could build something as well. Um, so I remember uh, there's definitely the ladder builder, uh, the ones that build the, the the ladders one, not the ladders one, the stepping stones, the builder. And, and it was very very kind of like one block then the step up, one block then the step up, and it gives you a little bit of an indication of when it's finished. Because you get that pluck 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 that skill you required for you to just put the brick at the very very last minute so you get that extra width so that was definitely my favorite oh no now you're making me really have to think um um, um is that is that enough is that a fair amount i can't remember the eighth what's the eighth yeah i think that's where my memory runs out i'm afraid come on and you had the one who blows up his name i always forget oh the, the exploding one does the, the... Yeah, the explodey ones, of course. Uh, the bomber. I should have known that. <laughs> I'm Northern Irish, I should have known. <laughs> the game kind of introduces them in such a way that makes you think, okay, these things have got a single use, and once you've figured out that one use, then that's it, that's all, all these characters can do. But it's when you start to realise that you can combine the abilities, that's when things start to get quite interesting. So when you want a lemming to build a really high bridge and then you realise that at the end of it, if you don't make them a floater as well, he's going to plummet to his death. So then suddenly you're making him a floater and then you go, well, I'm going to have to make everyone a floater, so I better make him a blocker to stop people falling off the edge. And then uh, later on in the game, you realise you can dig slightly down under him and make, uh, the, whole, the whole thing, I'm getting quite nerdy going into it, but the depth to the strategy involved to what is essentially just eight very simple roles by combining those abilities you can get to some really kind of quite deep strategies When we were doing Lemmings, actually building the editor into the game really turned things around in terms of being able to go quickly in between creating levels and testing them. There was no delay going between edit mode and play mode. You might be talking at maybe 50 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds at most. And you just don't get that nowadays. It was so powerful and so fast to make these really cool levels. Without the level editor to just go, what makes it easy, what makes it hard, in and out easily, it would have been impossible. 
editor allowed the level designer to position blocks and to set where the lemmings originated from, from a trap door, and where the lemmings hoped to get to the, the exit. The editor also had the ability to select certain parts of the level that could not be dug away or bashed away. It's not just a case of, I don't need that block, or I should have an entire block there. The levels had to be, you know, that needs to be one pixel over, or, you know, he's fallen one pixel too far, I'll just put another block just up a little bit to stop him dying. Some levels were straightforward. You could see that you had to get from there to there by building over a, an obstacle, but digging through an obstacle. Some levels, not so easy to work out because it took the use of the limited skills that were available to then solve the level. So that was where the puzzle elements of the, the game were introduced. If you had the builder, you could basically finish half the levels for just that if you had an infinite amount of builders. But since they limit everything or only have give you one or two for each level, you have to think far more creatively. And that's that was very clever. There was an opportunity for the level designer to type in a name for the level. And the level names I remember were just clues that sometimes were exceedingly helpful, sometimes a little bit more obtuse. But I'm afraid I have to admit, I can't remember the level name. The first level was called Just Dig. And that was a clue as to what skill to use in the level to get through. Creating the levels uh, for the first time in the game was quite a creative period. The built-in editor to Lemmings allowed us all to create levels. We all had our own discs. It was all based on an Amiga. The PC didn't have the editor built in. Basically what happened was that we all made levels, lunch times, and evenings, and levels were coming through thick and fast. So it was me, Gary, and Scott did the levels that formed the backbone of it. <laughs> I, I made, you know, it must have been a few dozen. I like to paint big pictures of things, so I, I'd use the full five screens worth and make a really nice picture that you have to work your way through. I also really like making the player do multiple things, so there'd be multiple exits and you have to continually go back and forward. I enjoyed making levels that looked quite minimalistic, I think, is the, the phrase that uh, some of the other team used to describe my levels as. Scott was kind of similar to me, you know, like, that he liked to do pictures, but they tended to be more compact. And Dave, whenever he did a level, he challenged everybody to come through the office and fix it and, and, and complete it. And we'd run through and go, yeah, you just do this. And go, oh, yeah, oh, okay, go away then. And then five minutes later, he strips all back through again. What about this now? Oh yeah, you fix that, but that's wrong there now. That, that's a real easy. Oh yeah, okay. So he got a couple in, but it took him a long time. Obviously the game lent itself to a level designer because of the nature of the game. You could open it up to that kind of democratization. What I regret and, and what would certainly probably happen these days is the levels should be attributed to the guy who designed them because some of them were fiendishly difficult. Initially when we started, we were doing the kind of basic levels that you, you, you kind of think most people would do. But then after a kind of you know a week or so of us playing with them, we got so good at landings. We, you know, no level could could beat us at all. And it wasn't just a case of they put us down then we would eventually make it. We'd spot solutions in seconds because we were so used to it. So we, we'd spend all our time in, in the level editor trying to come up with levels that could beat everybody else. And that meant the levels were incredibly difficult because we were having to beat master players at this point. One of our jobs as a publisher was to kind of wind some of those back a bit and say, look, guys, you know, if we're going to play this through on a linear progression, people are going to get to level 60 and go no further. Lemus was in development for a few months and the original intention was to release the game round about November 1990 for the, the Christmas market. Through consideration, it was decided to hold off and introduce easy levels at the beginning where you can get used to the skills, what the lemons can do using each particular skills. So there's 120 levels in the final game, but we actually made about 200 or so. We had a, a mass of levels that had been created, so we had to then select the ones that we thought were 
appropriate, the ones that we thought gave a good variety of types of levels to solve. It was mainly my responsibility to compile the levels together, but it would be discussed, people would give their, their views on what makes a, a level that was worthy of being included in the game. Imagine that we had these 200 levels that we had to actually hone down what was good, what was bad. Nobody wants to throw their babies away. So there was lots of arguments as to which levels were going to go where and that sort of thing. And then they had to be graded in difficulty. And there was a big fight for the last level, who would have the hardest level. Um, and Scott won that out with the run of the mountain one. I remember being gutted that he won the hardest level. That was That was funny. And it wasn't until we really started honing down what a level actually was and then coming up with the idea of having this sort of tutorial initial stage for the first, I think it's the first 12 levels, we kind of considered a tutorial where they flowed one into the other, that it all really started coming together as a game where people could see the potential in it. What is so great about the artwork of Lemmings is the functionality of it. The fact that there's a clear entrance, a clear exit, there's a clear visual language of what the Lemmings are doing. There's good contrast with the black and the little characters. The animations are clear and expressive, and the whole thing is just like, it communicates as a game. The best thing about Lemmings is it never gave you the one that you really need for that level. I always remember that. It's just, come on, just give me the punching one again. I just make my way through the whole level then. But no, no, I go to ones that dig down and that. Oh, I don't want that one. The learning curve is like, this is a, it's a master, a masterpiece. It's, 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 it should be like in every textbook on how to, how to make a game. Nowadays, when you start a new game, it quite explicitly says, here is the tutorial. You are now going to learn how to do this, then this, then this, and this. And you're like, right, come on, make one. Lemmings is one of those games that gave you all the tutorials without making you aware that that's what was going on. So the first few stages, one would introduce the digger, one would introduce the basher, one would introduce the floater. You didn't think anything of it because it was just a different puzzle and you were learning it. But by the time you've got through those first 10 or so levels, you've already learned all the rules of the game or the majority of the rules of the game. Without realising it, you'd gone through the tutorial and it wasn't, it wasn't a chore. It's just this brilliant way of, again, just kind of staggering the way that you introduce game design concepts and you slowly allow the player to build confidence, but the game designers are always just one step ahead of you, right? When you think you've got one something figured out, in the next level, they'll throw you another loop. The difficulty progression throughout the whole game, you know, it would go up and then down a bit, you know, give you a wee break, you know, go up a bit more, down a bit, until you got to the end. So it was all beautifully paced, and every single one of my levels was either too easy or too hard, and as a result, none of them got in. So that's my claim to fame. All my original Lemmings levels were rejected. I can remember playing Populous while we were making Lemmings. It was an inspiration for the characters, and it was definitely an inspiration on the two-player version of Lemmings. I think if Populous hadn't had its two-player version, Lemmings would not have had its two-player on, on the Amiga. We couldn't work out how we're going to test Populous, how we're going to balance Populous. So we got a, something called the RS-232 cable. And there were supposed to be cables that you plugged from the Amiga into a printer, or from the SD into a printer. But if you took the cable apart, swapped the pin 2 and pin 3 over, you could use it to connect two computers together. And then we thought, well, this is it. This is how we're going to balance the whole game. This is how we're going to test it. Glenn and I, as I said, used to play games um, against each other. And, you know, we thought it would be stupid to remove all that functionality. Why don't we leave it in? Even though the thought of people getting the soldering iron out and swapping the leads over probably meant that, you know, 10 people did it or something. But it was really where the game was the most fun, I think. Dave delighted in beating us on Populous and he really wanted to add an element to Lemmings that had that same 
compelling, just one more go, just one more go and I'll meet you. And he was able to do it because he could plug two mice into the Amiga and into the ST. So they both got the multiplayer lemmings on PC. At that time, I could not get two mice plugged into a PC because there was no mouse driver that actually supported that. But Populous definitely was something that we were aware of. The two-player aspect of Lemmings definitely comes from playing Populous. Well, that is, that is incredible to hear. And I have to thank them for the stress release of Lemmings when I was coding Powermonger. I probably would have gone insane if it wasn't for that. And I have here some uh, examples of levels. The one player levels were normally just designed using the game editor, but the two player levels had to be thought out so that they were more fair for each player. So that's why two player levels were more drawn out and planned before going into the editor. I recently actually tried the multiplayer out with my wife and we're like, this is actually this is actually really good. The object of the, the two player was to get as many of either colour lemmings through your exit and not the opponent's exit. So mainly the players were head to head against one another, but occasionally it did require cooperation. I particularly remember a time when playing a two player level I was urged to do a lot of the building, which I thought was fine. So I was doing that while the other player was doing other things. And then I was double crossed and ended up losing most of my levels for the other player to, to take them all to his exit. So as well as cooperation, it does require being cautious. Nobody ever talks about Lemmings multiplayer. I think because at the time you needed two mice and nobody had two mice, very few people would go out and buy another mouse for their Amiga unless the first one was broken. So I think by the time Lemmings had established itself as a kind of household name, I think by that point a lot of people had learned to embrace it as a single player game because the multiplayer was so underused. So presumably as the as the series progressed and went on, the multiplayer was kind of left behind because not enough people played it in the first place, more probably down to lack of controllers, lack of mice, rather than the actual lack of quality of the mode itself, which it was a fun mode. Certainly nowadays, you've got to imagine if a new Lemmings came out, um, you've got online multiplayer, it's, 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 a, it's a no-brainer, or you've got controllers with analog sticks and it's a lot easier to move a cursor. Um, a multiplayer Lemmings nowadays um, would, would, be, would be great. Scott Johnston, who did the amazing background graphics for Lemmings, had a brother, Brian. We were needing somebody to do music, because at this point, Psygnosis wasn't involved. And we got Brian to come along. We'd done a bit of music on his own, and uh, we got him to do a variety of tunes. The original pitch was actually to use lots of old TV theme tunes. So we used to have the Batman theme tune and the Adams Family and the Monsters and things like that until somebody explained to us what copyright was and that we weren't allowed to do that. And so I think that was why it came to the point that Tim was brought in to create some more tunes. Lemmings. Yeah, how did that actually happen? I believe it was a phone call out of the blue from a producer. He called me and said, we've got this game that's coming out on the Amiga. We've got a problem with the music. You'll realize why when you hear it, but it's all kind of themes from TV shows like Batman and you know that kind of thing. And the release date is looming and we really need some replacement music. So I think I've probably done about three or four Amiga soundtracks prior to that. So I was a known quantity. And, you know, the chances of me being able to deliver this in the time that was available was quite likely. I seem to recall going into the Psygnosis offices, seeing the game, not being particularly impressed by it at the time. Just saw these little sprites moving around and thought, they're moving really slowly. This doesn't look like a particularly exciting or dramatic game. I was impressed that there were so many on screen at the same time. But then after playing with it for a little while, I could see the fun aspect. 
and I listened to the, the music that they had in place at the time. And they liked the concept that the music would be stuff that people would know, that there would be some well-known tunes in there, but they had to be out of copyright. So old folk tunes, uh, you know, stuff that kids would sing at school, that kind of thing. But there was also room for original composition as well. And someone also came up with the idea of why don't we ape other Psygnosis titles that we were sure that the copyright resides with Psygnosis. So with this information and with this brief, I was then given a very specific music composer that I hadn't used before. They didn't want to use any of the tools that I was used to. It was this tracker that I didn't even know existed. Oh, the other thing was that they needed one sound channel of the four that were available on the Amiga permanently for sound effects, so I could only write three-channel music as well. Oh, and then I was told that you could only play notes, and I think I could change the volume, but nothing clever like changing um, the offset of where you start a sample. Oh, there was one other caveat as well, that the, you had a bunch of samples that you could use for all of the songs, apart from those that clearly were modelled on existing Psygnosis games. You were permitted some extra samples for those. Oh, and did I know that there was virtually no memory for these as well? Which, to be honest, wasn't a major problem because when you're composing music for the Amiga, 99 times out of 100, uh, you're kind of an afterthought. The game is created, the gameplay is progressed, maybe the art is kind of improved along the way, and then they go, we should really put some sounds in this. Time scale was, was very, very short, as I recall. It was a matter of weeks. And so during that time, I produced probably a third of them were classic, yoldy, worldy uh, folk tunes, or stuff I could remember from childhood that I kind of guessed would be copyright free. Another third would be tunes that just melodies that I created at the time. The samples that had to be used in all of the tunes, bar the special tunes, they kind of lent themselves to certain melodies, I guess. And then, yeah, probably another third were things like Shadow of the Beast, the Pugsy theme. You would think they'd be easy to do, but when you've only got three channels, limited memory, you don't have all those kind of crazy effects that you can do to the samples. Still a bit of a challenge. I did create some purely original stuff, but I also did stuff like take one of the old folk tunes and then follow that so that you've got the main theme in there and then just kind of go off on a tangent. I just, I guess I thought, well, we're done with the main melody. Time to have a bit of fun, put my own stamp on it, maybe. And then I presented all of these tunes initially to Psygnosis, and then they were sent it to the DNA offices. And I don't think I had to change much. I think they were just happy to have the tunes on time and, and they be, you know, what was asked for. Listenable and, uh, and clearly memorable, I think. Some of the original music did make it into the game. It was only the ones that had a you know, copyright issue. So um, obviously, how much is that doggy in the window? And 10 green bottles. I think they were okay. They were copyright free. Of course, they were quite at liberty to say, we don't like it, and we don't like this guy, and we don't want to work with him. Those guys did a, a really good job on the, the music. That was a real collaboration with Psygnosis to actually put that stuff together. right off the bat the box art was very cartoonish and kiddy almost like a children's television show and it was compelling because like you didn't expect to see that kind of box cover with a Cygnosis logo on it 
for lemmings, everything had to be different. But the only thing that was carried over from the Cygnosis brand was the Cygnosis name, the owl, and the packaging style. Other than that, it was unique. By the October, November, December timeframes, Cygnosis were fully on board and had really gotten it. And they were helping us with music and starting to put artwork together and getting what these characters were really like as well for a box art and things like that and starting to kind of get into the this whole characterization. The game had spawned from a deep in animation on the Amiga computer where the characters were only 10 pixels maximum height. There was no concept art that was done previous to the the game being initiated and developed so it was quite late on in the process that realized that we needed a a character design so i had an idea of what i thought the the lemons characters would look like close up what i have here is the first pencil sketches that I did of Lemmings. What I thought was the the essence of the character was a character that didn't really think much because as you play them on the screen, they don't really make their own decisions. They only respond to what the player does. So I wanted to do a character that I felt was not really thinking very much, kind of floppy. So the drawing that I did for the feet here I wanted to try and emphasize the floppy nature of the feet and the hair. So that was part of the aspect of the character that I developed there. From those pencil drawings, I came up with some ink drawings. And these were what we sent to Cygnosis for them to then commission the box artwork. In these early drawings, the lemmings have a, a solid one color eyeball. At that point, imagine them to be more like a, a mouse eye or a little rodent eye. So that was the just the way the, the character was initially done. But over the development of the, the characters, the, the solid eye was changed to a, a sleepy half open eye, which I thought helped to contribute to the, the notion that the lemmings didn't really think much from themselves. They were sort of a, a floppy, droopy little character that would just go about its its business, fall off the end of a, a cliff if that's what, what happened. And here are some other drawings. The lemming digging, throwing up the ground around it. Uh, the lemming with its little pack of of bricks that it used to build. There's a basher and a climber there. This lemon has its pickaxe and ready to do some mining. That was the impression that I had of the lemmings and that was the, the images that we sent to Cygnosis. And Cygnosis then got an artist to create the, the box art with a, a large lemming on the cover. I was painting murals in nursing homes for a large company with residents who had dementia and Alzheimer's. And I would sit with them and hear a story about what they remembered in life. And mostly it was about comics, Dandy, Beano, Eagle, all of those early days comics. And they would remember their childhood. And so I would paint a mural in the corridors of the nursing home with that person in mind. And I would sit for a long time with them. And these nursing homes were all over the Northwest. And I spent many years doing that. I inherited a talent from my father. My father was a Royal Academy artist. He was left-handed, I'm left-handed. And I'm quite proud of that that I had a gift where my two brothers didn't have the same gift. All of my life I've been painting pictures, advertising, sign writing, I learned how to sign write, 
Um, one day, um, a colleague from a printing company said, how are you on drawing cartoons? We've got this, there's a new game coming out. Now, that meant nothing at all to me. Um, and we're going to produce the packaging, the launch, point of sale, everything. But we've got to come up with an image. And so we drove into Liverpool to Harrington Docks, where Ignosis were. And there was this chap sat. We were introduced. And I just sat watching these ping pong balls with no idea whatsoever he was doing. He did explain it. But that's a long time ago, 30 years. I left uh, Psygnosis, as I recall, almost in a dream, because I thought, what on earth am I entering into here? This was my, well, not my first taste of big industry. I'd done artwork for major companies. But this was, yeah, um, and from there on, and, and it was pressure, from then on, I was burning the midnight oil, if you like, coming up with an idea. The visits became more frequent. The first one was within a week. And then after that, I think we were sort of into every couple of days going to visit them. So it was backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards from Southport to Liverpool until one day it just ping. That's the one. A lemming with green hair and a blue body. Right, what we now want is a box cover design. There we go. He's the first character I, I designed. And I wanted him to head up this team of lemmings that were coming out of holes in the ground, walking down hills, blowing themselves up and just doing daft things. And it was fun creating all that just as I went along. So I started with a figure in the middle, then all these other characters all round, trying to get out of the scenario they were in. They were coming in by plane, so the floaters were coming down. Some of the umbrellas broke. Just great fun. The artwork is twice as big as this, 24 inches square. So it was a big piece of artwork, the, the front. A lot of it was airbrushed at the time and a separate piece for the Lemmings logo. And that has become a, a very iconic Im image. And I've loosely based the word Lemmings on a font that I, I liked and played around with the lettering. So that is a hand-lettered logo. And then I started with the characters within the letters. So I put the characters in as well. And that, over the years, has proved very popular. People like that piece of artwork in its own right. And then they said, can you do a bit more activity for the back? So there are heaps of characters in there doing acrobats, knocking each other out. Just mad, mad ideas at the time. Look, I've got a poster in the, the box out here, so just wait to have a look. It has many, many lemmings all around doing some of the, the skills that are in the game. And there is one larger lemming in the centre, which is in a pose that the lemmings don't actually do in the game. I hope no one... Uh, objected to that. There are some things in the picture that the lemmings don't actually do in the game. There's a lemming that is punching another lemming, but the lemmings aren't aggressive to each other. Over here, one of the lemmings is actually dressed up as a lollipop lemming. There's a, a little lemming here in an airplane, but the lemmings don't fly airplanes in the game. The poster kind of represents what the lemmings do in the game, but not every detail that you see in the poster uh, reflects something that actually happens in the game. But it gave a, a certain feel of what the lemming looked like anyway, so uh, that was good. After the initial um, design, the single lemming, which is what I call a lookout and is on the cover of the box, 
then they said, can you come up with the other characters? And I said, it's like Snow White and Seven Dwarves. I think there are seven different characters I had to come up with. The, the most famous to me was the umbrella, the floater. It was quite easy, as I recall, once the, once the image had been produced, then to turn him into another, another motivation on the screen. And then they wanted point of sale material, a life-size lemming, which was being sent out to all the major stores in the country. Point of sale counter displays of all the characters. There were badges, brooches, pens, I think, and mugs. And I remember they were quite, quite a collector's piece, especially the floater, the one with the umbrella, was made into a little figure with a back piece on it that made it, you stuck it onto your worktop and it, it wobbled up and down. But it was only made of paper, it wasn't plastic or anything or had any kind of hinges. It was just a paper and, and it bounced up and down. I think they were quite popular in the time for all kinds of products. Here are some of the items that were created to go in the shop alongside the boxes of lemmings as they were on for sale. This is a lemming. Yeah, it could be used to stand up to advertise the product, as well as the stand-ups. There were stickers produced and some badges, uh, a little dangly thing that advertised the lemming's demo disc. And here is a... A mouse mat has never been used, still in its wrapper. Collector's yeah. item, mouse mat. But it was just such an exciting time. And people would ask me, oh, what are you doing at the moment? And say, so, well, this game is coming out shortly and I'm illustrating it. Yeah, it was a great fun. <laughs> Signosis definitely got involved in helping us to hone those levels down and testing them, making sure that levels were completable. Dave took one down to, to Signosis as a progress report uh, when the game was kind of getting on. And he and Ian and John went out for lunch. And by the time he came back, it was on every machine he said in the office and they were all playing it. So that kind of started to give us an inkling. We also had a philosophy within the company that nobody had the exclusive on Say So. So, yeah, you know, we'd have everybody in the company playing this game. The feedback we got was quite positive. It seemed that a lot of the staff there were playing the game and enjoying it. It seemed to be that whoever was getting a chance to play the game was giving favourable responses to it. But, you know, to be quite honest, there wasn't much to say because it was it was what it was. <laughs> no, nowadays in, in in the twenty twenties, people look back at Lemmings and think, "Wow, that's what games used to look like back then." No, it wasn't. Lemmings looked rubbish back then. I'll clarify that. It looked it looked the animation was fantastic. To be clear, we knew how good it was. How do you communicate that? You couldn't take a double page spread in a Amiga Weekly or whatever it was called. And, you, know, you couldn't advertise it on television. You couldn't explain to people what it was in any meaningful way. The only way you could do it was to put it into people's hands. So if you recall, the marketing strategy that was born out of that was to do the little disc in a sleeve a countertop product for 50 pence with eight levels on it. This is a demo disc that's contained a few levels that the player can play to give a, a taster of what the, the final game is like. And if people bought the whole game, they got a 50p refund. Incidentally, we sold many hundreds of thousands of those discs. I don't think anybody ever asked for a refund. And it was just enough to get you hooked. Uh, really hooked. He was so desperate for the rest of it. And then after that, it just exploded as the public kind of got wind of it. 
Before then, it was just a kind of, we think it's good, but I don't really know. And then, yeah, it just exploded after that. But I didn't realize they, they, they were charging for the, the little demo disc, that's funny. From start to finish of Lemmings, it was around about nine months. Uh, we'd started um, a, sometime in May, and we released the game February the 14th, 1991. It got good reviews. The first reaction overall was incredible. I remember Lemmings getting stellar reviews. What's not to like? Some even unusually gave the game 100% people that didn't get it or didn't think it was very good. They must have been few and far between because, I mean, it raked in every award that it couldn't. I think when the year end came around as well, it ended up winning a bunch of Game of the Year awards that year as well. Yeah, we, we gave it, I think, five or six pages in the one, which we were generally, we had this system where the bigger, more interesting games, we'd, we'd give those, you know, more space. However, we would to get the older guy who would have some kind of axe to grind about. Oh, this is very neat bit. Uh, we were in the 16 bit world, heading pretty quickly towards 32 bit. But the reviews generally were nobody saw this coming, and it is great. We were very pleased. We were very pleased with the reviews. Even better that we know that we hadn't really paid for them or anything like that. I still have my collection of the Lemons reviews in the magazines from the time they came out, yes. Main has got released, you know. Had reviews, Blood Money got released, had reviews, and, and Lemmings got released, it had reviews, and then newspapers wanted to talk to us. So yeah, that that was that was definitely different. The Lemmings release was, I mean, it was so much different. The um, the first games, I mean, Ballistics, Blood Money, they just came out. Nothing really happened. You'd see adverts in magazines, and then when my ports came out, they'd appear in shops, and you'd maybe see an advert here and there, and a review, and that was about it. But as soon as Lemmings came out as a demo, I mean, we started getting lots of press interest for interviews and, and photographs, and they were coming up to see us and see what we were doing. It was just, I mean, it was totally different and just off the scale. I took to hiding, I seem to remember, because I didn't like getting my picture taken, particularly because the first one of the first times that we got a kind of actual studio expose on, on what we were doing, they took us up to the Law Hill and we we did this picture of us all lying on the ground looking up. And we were all squinting up at the sky because it was too bright. And that was such a stupid picture. When that came out, it was a double page spread in the middle of a magazine. And then you compare it to what, like, the Bitmap brothers, who were the cool guys, you know, in dark rooms wearing sunglasses. It's, oh, no, I'm not doing that again. So I took to hiding whenever they came up. So for most of the uh, 90s, you won't find a picture of me because I'm just, I'm away. The Amiga version launched on... February the 14th, 1991. We all went down to probably Boots or John Menzies and we watched people buying our game off the shelves. I worked on that. It was, it was quite an interesting feeling. I knew what the launch date was <coughs> and I went to a, a town called Preston that day on some other business. And as we passed the shop, this computer shop, the window was festooned with my artwork. All over, everywhere, there were just my artwork. So the person I was with said, why don't you go in and tell them? I can't remember what story it was. I said, no, no, no. This is their day. I've had my day. Go. So I went in and I said to one of the sales assistants, um, I'm the actual artist who produced this image, this box. And she went and got the manager, and the manager said, could you stay an hour? He said, we've got people coming in, buying the game. To have you here as well will be good for us. So I did it. Didn't get paid, but I, I quite enjoy signing people's boxes, sat at a desk. And apparently I did a lot of that, but I can't remember. Can't remember. I know Dave says he was on the phone, as I know so a lot, finding out numbers, but he didn't really relay them back. I only found out those kind of numbers, when was it? 2011 or 12, when I met Dave, and he was, he was telling me all these numbers, that you know, you'd phone it up and it'd be 20,000, 30,000, 55,000 in the first day, which obviously in the first day sales, outclassed all these previous total game sales. It was, it was nuts, but we never knew anything about that. He kept the finances and stuff pretty close to his chest. It was one of the first games, really, where I 
just shouted at those dreadful, I wasn't going to swear then, but I'm not going to, those dreadful little little sprite. How quickly everything could absolutely go to hell just by putting one, one blocker or, or one character in the wrong place. That was the thing I loved about it the most, was it had that ability to kind of make you enjoy being frustrated. There's always that moment in a Lemmings level, particularly later on when it gets, starts to get really tricky, when you begin to realize that it's getting away from you a little bit. And I would shout, what the hell are you doing? Didn't use the word hell. Fine then, fine, you all just go over there. What the hell are you doing going over there? Ah! Stop. The Lemmings are starting to fall off the cliff and I can't save them and oh, let me try to fix it. Oh no, I've made it worse. Remember you used to look at those old magazine ads of people playing video games and they look like this. <laughs> but Lemmings is one of those games that actually made you make those faces. <laughs> and some, you have to let them die, don't you? Sometimes you have to kill some of them to save the others. I know there was the, the, the blocker one. They have a terrible future ahead of them when you choose them to be designated to be a blocker. You couldn't get him back out of blocking, so it's kind of a sacrificial play. Okay, there's no going back from the blockers. So you have to do some destruction in order to save, and I think that is really, really wonderful. The sacrificing element of it, uh, I, it's a terrible thing to say. Do I want to admit it? Uh, who doesn't like explosions? I remember going around to our next door neighbours. He would just set it all up and then put the two blockers in place, make sure that they all came out. So you're just seeing them walking backwards and forwards and then he would just kill them all. It's a weird paradox level. It's a game that it's even fun to lose. The entertaining animations are all when the lemmings die. <laughs> You're always happy to be losing because it's just so funny as all the lemmings are kind of spilling hopelessly off a cliff. So if you play it really well, you don't get to see all the great death animations. I remember having a whole range of feelings playing the games as a kid from, from joy, frustration, from feeling sad like I'd let them down when they just all walked off the edge of a cliff or something. When we discovered one night that you could dig under a blocker, um, and save them without without uh, having to blow them up. That was just like someone explaining to you how black holes work. For 30 years I've been letting them die and making them commit suicide. Now you tell me. The best quote of Lemons I ever heard uh, was from Terry Pratchett, who said he got so hooked on the game that not only did he delete it from his machine, but he overwrote it to make sure he could never get it back again because he got nothing done with it. <laughs> if Lemmings hadn't existed, could be argued that um, a number of other games may never have existed as well. You know, Worms is a, probably the standout product where people say that this was massively influenced by Lemmings. You know, and that's a billion pound company now. There's something about the cute little simple pixelated characters with the little high-pitched voices that explode that just kind of tie those two games a little bit together in in my mind for sure there have been plenty of other games that could be fair to say are probably homages to uh, to lemmings even nintendo like the mario versus donkey kong series started off as a series of kind of platformers but over time as the series progressed went fairly heavy with kind of puzzle style levels where you control a bunch of small Kind of robotic toy Mario's, which looks suspiciously like lemmings, guiding them through the stages by assigning kind of roles to them and making sure they, they avoid dangers. There will be games that have followed that model, but nothing with quite the emotional connection that Lemmings seems to have had with people. Lemmings' greatest legacy might just be opening the door and allowing publishers and developers to take greater financial and creative risks because it was so successful and it was so different. So the next person that comes in the door with a really out there idea might be nothing like Lemmings. The only thing it shares in common with Lemmings is the idea that it's a, a totally different kind of game. And people say, hmm, I don't know about this. Well, look at Lemmings. That was a totally different type of game. They took a punt on that and look at the success they had. And if you're drawing a map of like, you know, landmark moments where something came along that was totally new and invented not, not even just a new genre, but a new way of thinking about how you could approach 
you know, uh, what's possible in video games. Lemmings, I think, absolutely is one of those, those markers along the way. Thinking about the history of computer games, the lineage of, of, of many titles that we think <laughs> of in today's world, Lemmings holds a very, very important spot because it proved, I think, that the puzzle game genre, you know, can have emotions in it. It proved that by applying technology to the gameplay, you can come up with a whole new way of presenting problems to the players. I think it's really up there in the important titles. And certainly, I think it'll, it'll be remembered in the history of computer gamings and, and should be remembered for all time. I was like, this is just amazing. I get a chance to develop a modern version of a great classic. And I really wanted to do it justice. And all of my references were from the 91 Lemmings. So I was the lead artist and later art director on the project. I wanted the new mobile character to have the same spring in their step, the same moppy hair. I knew it was going to be a fun journey to reimagine that and so many options we could take it in. As with the tests of the original game, we had to look at doing tests for the new character and I worked with the concept artist at the time, Daphne. We went through iterations of lots of little silhouettes. We had like bean-like characters, pixel-type characters, and she thought I was crazy because I was dismissing all these completely beautiful, lovable concepts. And I kept just simplifying it. I was like, I just want it simpler. And I kept pointing at that pixel art, that 10 pixel high. And we even had the sprite sheet and I was sort of like, look at, look at the big moppy, look at the big moppy hair and look at the bounce in his step. And look at those feet, those, those are big feet, you know? They're like big white clown feet. And, you know, you can really see the hands. And, and then when we were looking at it little, it was like, less is more. Like these, these characters have to work on the screen really small. So you didn't even need arms. Our new character just has the hands because you just need to see the hand swing and you need to see the, the foot movement. So we got away with anything that was unnecessary. So we just had this simple beam body and we had these big feet and these big hands. And then we had the hair and the hair was the star, you know, it, it has to flop and, it, and they have to look like blank canvases. They have to have naivety. We did such exploration with the eyes, like we did the little highlights on the eyes, we did the big cute eyes, we did all sorts of like eye experimentations. And I just kept saying, I like just the black dot. And it was like, but why do you like the black dot? And it was like, because the black dot is just like, it just simplifies the character. I knew straight away that the colour palette I wanted was a lighter green and a lighter blue, kind of a more electric blue and a, and a lime green kind of hair, just to kind of give it some zing, a bit more contemporary vibrancy. And this is what you've been waiting for. We didn't have to prove the value of the game like the first developers did. Uh, but we did have to see if we were going along the right lines. And you can see here the first sort of blobby test, which we refused. We were like, no, this isn't feeling right. Um, we referred back to the original sprite sheet animation and we got this, which has got a lot more spring in his step. And when you watch him walk very small, we got really excited. It was that floppy hair, the big feet and the swinging of the arm. And then we did some sort of head turn tests with the, the blocker. I was like, yeah, it's going to be really iconic. Never as iconic as the 10 pixel one, but definitely a evolution of that. These are a couple of images that I personally feel really sum up. What's the word? I'm happy with this. This is the target of what we were trying to achieve. It's the original Lemmings, but on mobile, it's clean, simple, and you can see that one informed the other. It was great for me because I knew what Lemmings was. <laughs> it was. It just leapt into my head straight away, like, oh, cool, doing Lemmings. I know what that can look like on mobile. I look forward to this. Yeah, it was a privilege. That wasn't easy, but I think they, they nailed it. The original game was designed for playing with a mouse in a screen of very low resolution where the pixels are very big. 
and you can with the mouse be very precise on which instructions you you pick and which lemming they go the issue with that is that in in a mobile phone the thumb although you would think that it's very precise because you put it where you want in reality it is not right there is no single pixel where you are selecting and if you have very little creatures in your phone screen you are not going to be able to to select one of them to specifically assign an instruction to one of the lemmings so the idea was to make it easier by dividing the game screen into a grid that has bigger positions to select and with that you can instead of selecting the the lemmings selecting the instructions where they go and where the lemming is gonna activate it so that makes it a lot easier to play on the phone and then this was a really fun idea that i thought i'd show you it starts now so a lemming falls off he dies so a lemming falls off has an umbrella equipped he gets to the bottom and then so all it, so all the other lemmings are safe he leaves it there and they carry on the reason for this was at the time if you think about it we're placing actions on the level not on the lemmings so in the old lemmings you would equip all of the lemmings with umbrellas and as they fall off, they would use their umbrella. But in our game, you place an umbrella in the world. And at this point, we were only placing one umbrella. And we were like, so how does that one umbrella help everyone? So we were like, well, maybe he floats down and he leaves it. And it's a cool little trampoline. And whilst it's really cute, everyone thought about it and design came up with a much better idea, which is that the action that the lemming walks through equips every single lemming with an umbrella if they walk for it, which is a lot more elegant. <laughs> it changes a bit the, the way the game is played, obviously, because you can plan in advance what is going to happen in that level and then see it through. So we had to reinvent a lot of things and it's not meant to be compared to the original. You can't say which one's best because they are absolutely different. Like the mobile version has to be easier to input on your phone. It has to be bolder and clearer. And you need to have that very long tail so the players never run out of progression to achieve. And we do that basically through a couple of systems. First is the, the levels and the world. Every so often we are releasing new worlds with the new levels and mechanics. I think our game at the moment has more than 4,000 levels. And the collection. Every month we have a new season with new lemmings to collect. It gives you a, an extra incentive to keep playing. We started out just drawing a few here and there. We thought about holidays or maybe countries and, you know, things like that. And then it took a life of its own. Um, we are at currently just about over a thousand <laughs> tribe costumes. Some of my favorite tribes that I've worked on are probably the nautical one. The color palette just kind of came out really nice. I personally love Halloween, so I really like doing the Halloween themed things. I also really enjoyed doing things like ancient civilizations, like Mayan or Egyptian or ancient Greek. When you collect tribe characters, they unlock like a challenge level, and each tribe character has like their own challenge level. Yeah, if it's too easy, it's, it's, it gets a little bit boring, but the challenge levels definitely keep it fresh. I was searching for a game to play to kill time when I was going home, and I discovered Lemming. Isn't this the game that I used to play when I was a kid? And it really enacted that nostalgia inside me. And that's the beauty of having a developer who respects the original and then just growing it to the current generation who likes collectibles and customizations. People have got 10-15 minutes to sit around and play something on a mobile. It's an exciting game, well worth playing. Lemmings' legacy is helping the studio leap forward to develop one of the most successful video game series on the planet.
When we think Grand Theft Auto now, of course, we think Rockstar. You got to remember, it was originally created by DMA Designs. I don't think GTA would have happened in the way it did if it hadn't been for the success of Lemons and how that allowed the company to grow and experiment with new projects, to take the hit when a project under development wasn't working and had to be cancelled. That kind of creative bubble existed for four or five years until I guess the money ran out. Um, but during that time, it meant that games had a chance to evolve over a period of time uh, in a way that often they don't now. We didn't have producers or project managers. Um, no one ever said no. It was uh, incredibly creative. And uh, you know there was an opportunity for everyone to, to have a say in terms of the design of a game and how that game was actually created. The first game, you know, and it's million plus units was certainly a, a big enough success for them to build on. Uh, but I don't think at first, even through GTA 1 and maybe GTA 2, anybody saw it as ever going to be as successful as Lemmings. It wasn't until later that it became, a, you know, something that's eclipsed, uh, you know, Lemmings and, and most other games behind it. People don't really think about it in the context, but if this was movies, these would be like the biggest blockbusters in the world made right here in Scotland. And you can trace the roots of that right back to that original DMA team and Lemmings and the inspiration that they gave all of us to believe that we could do it here. DMA were asked to be involved in the setting up of the computer games courses that were starting up in Aberty University. We managed to persuade Aberty University that computer games was something that they should be teaching. The Aberty was the first place in the world where you could study games degrees directly. Those degrees exist because there was a need to supply a growing games industry. The impact of Lemmings and DMA on game development in Scotland has been huge. It was really the rocket fuel that propelled the Scottish games industry to where it is now. It's gratifying to see that there are so many companies now. There is so much activity going on in the area and so diverse as well. It's not all just on AAA games, but it's across the board. I still look back on the original DMA stuff. It was such a good, good fun. It was, you know, four or five of us that are all friends before making games. And we all did it because we love doing it and we still love doing it. But it didn't really matter if we succeeded at that point. We just love making games and love doing it together. So the fact that we, you know, for a few years we, we got to do it would have been fine. The fact that it went on to such big things, it's, it's amazing, really. And yeah, you, you take a bit of pride in the fact that it was, it was there. But I think you take more pride in the fact that people enjoyed your games. You know, you made games and people liked them. And that's what that's why we did it. We didn't do it to kind of start this huge industry. Or anything. We did it because we like making games and we like people enjoying our games. Um, and we still do. It does feel special, but only in retrospect and only when I concentrate. <laughs> you know?
So, sum up lemmings in three words. <laughs> three words. Uh, it's a community. Whoa, cute. Cute. Playful. Uh, and I don't want to sound too cheesy, but the idea that you have a community that you have to protect, and then you're a vital part of that community. A funny. It's a squelchy. Actually, inventive. Not a particularly clever word, but um, it is. It's in, it's cute and inventive. Um, wacky, addictive, addictive, enjoyable, and very frustrating, and challenging, stressful, and challenging, stressful. I would sum it up in a very different way rather than the game. But I would say uh, cute, inventive, and oh, last one, um, and blockers. Fun. There we go. Lemmings is something which I always associate as the best of the British games.